Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Today is May the 21st, 2017. Our guest today is editor, publisher, Mike Kelly. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Good. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm sorry. I, I think I was booked earlier in the year and I had to bail, but I'm very pleased to be here now. Thank you very much. Oh, no problem. No problem. I'm flexible. Um, all right. Let's talk about a couple of things and then we'll start talking to Mike uh, and do, do introductions and all that. Uh, first of all, I do want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to the, I've got like 52 patrons now and you guys are really helping me pay the bills. I really appreciate it. The link is in the, however you're listening, podcast or YouTube description if you want to help out, but it, it means a lot and the minimum is five bucks a month. So, uh, but I'm mainly talking to people who have already done it. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's kind of a load off. Um, let's see. Podcast. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, prizes. Matt, you got a prize. Let's talk about yours first. Okay. This is, um, this book's a couple years old. Uh, let me see. I'm figure out the publication date. Um, it's called Mists of the Miskatonic. It is by Al Halsey. It is basically a collection of short stories each uh, directly inspired by a Lovecraft story. All right. A uh, nice little paperback of stories. All right. That's cool that looking. Good. Yeah. Uh, Philip has four prizes, actually. Well, it's the same prize. But yes. Yes, but four <laughs> different people can win it. So. Four different people can win it. Uh, yeah, I've got um, uh, audio codes that will allow you to download a free copy of uh, my short story collection, Behold the Void. So um, I have actually have four codes that I can give away. So whoever wants to try and win those, I'll send you the instructions and the codes and you can listen to the scary stories while you drive or walk around the block or uh, sit in the bathtub or whatever people do. Yeah, and just briefly Almost. for those who don't know, uh, Behold the Void is is weird fiction slash horror, correct? Yes. Uh, horror, supernatural thrillers, weird fiction, uh, cosmic horror. Yep, all of the above. So basically every, every horror you can... It's horror. <laughs> yeah, it's horror. <laughs> all, all right. All the stuff you love. Yeah, all the good yeah. stuff. Well, uh, listen, Phil, Philip is a phenomenal writer, so if you get an audio book of one of his books, um, it's, it's a good thing. Um, if you want to email the show, it's lovecrafteasing at gmail.com. And I really appreciate emails about the show. Um, and remember if you're watching on YouTube, you can listen to the podcast version if you'd rather listen on the go. And if you've come to the podcast version and you're just listening, you can watch if you prefer to do it that way. So just let both, both, sets of listeners know that you can listen a different way and watch a different way. Uh, all right, let's do introductions and then let's talk to Mike Kelly. Why don't we start with SP and work our way over? I'm SP Miskowski and I write fiction. All right, Rick. You're, you're muted, buddy. All right, we'll come back to Rick here because you're still muted. Philip, and then maybe we can get to Rick. <laughs> uh, Philip Fercasi, I'm a screenwriter and horror author. My latest collection is, as we already discussed, Behold the Void from Journal Stone. All right, I think Rick's unmuted now. You know, Rick Lee, writer. Um, Matt. Matt Carpenter, I don't write fiction, I live it. <laughs> And you occasionally edit it as well. All uh, Kelly. I'm Kelly Young. I am the executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. Joe. Joe Polver, writer, editor. My latest project is The Madness of Cap Dr. Caligari, which was nominated along with Mike Davis's Autumn Cthulhu for this year's Shirley Jackson Award. And I'm Mike Davis. So 
Let's talk to Mike Kelly. Let's invert things a little bit. Um, if, well, first, let me ask you this, Mike. For those in the audience who do not know who Mike Kelly is, I mean, we do. Yeah. But for those who do not know, can you talk a little bit about yourself and sure. what you do? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I was a writer at one point. I was um, publishing uh, probably in the, in the mid-2000s, late 2000s, in a lot of small press magazines. Had a couple stories in the year's best uh, horror. Um, decided to start my own press because I had, <clears throat> I basically, the stuff I was writing was, I wasn't seeing a lot of venues for the stuff I was doing. Um, so I wanted to sort of start my own press. Uh, in 2009, I put out an anthology called Apparitions, which was a uh, Shirley Jackson Award nominee. Um, <clears throat> and I was completely shocked with that. So I thought, well, I maybe I'll keep trying this publishing thing. So <laughs> exactly. I kept publishing. Yeah. Um, shortly after that, I started the journal. It was a small sort of literary journal at the time called Shadows and Tall Trees. So basically, my idea was to sort of uh, model it on the old sort of lit journals, like what I call a lit rag. But 128 pages, five by eight inches, a very slim sort of um, um, elegant looking book. Um, so I did that and um, uh, it was very well received. 2010, I did the first one. And then 2011, I did the uh, second volume. 2012, World Horror, uh, World Fantasy Convention was in Toronto. So I did two volumes that year. Um, volume five came out the year after that. Then with, <clears throat> volume, with volume six, I decided... Uh, I was getting so much good stuff that I would actually do it as more of an anthology rather than the sort of literary. So the lit journal was sort of had reviews in it, um, you know, um, essays and stuff like that. So I, volume six, I moved it straight to an anthology, uh, 85,000 words. Uh, volume six was a World Fantasy Award nominee and Shirley Jackson Award nominee. So that's sort of the history of the press and me. So I used to write. Now I'm more known as a publisher and editor. And um, uh, once I finished, once uh, volume six of Shadows and Tall Trees came out, I sort of took a little hiatus on that and concentrated on single author collections. And also around that time, um, I was thinking of just before that, that again, there was, there was a need for a year's best weird fiction. And um, I thought somebody was would, would have done one uh, long before now. So um, basically I did a Kickstarter or Indiegogo, whatever it was, got some seed money and started that. Laird Barron was the first guest editor. Most of you probably already know this. Uh, Kathy Koja did volume two. Uh, Simon Strancis did volume three. Helen Marshall has just handed in volume four. Uh, and Robert Sherman has agreed to edit volume five. And I really can't believe I'm actually saying volume five already. So that's how far we've come. So i um, quite excited about the series and uh, I love having a guest editor each year and that's where we're at. And basically, I've, though I've been doing this since 2009 publishing, uh, it sort of feels like the press is just sort of getting its feet momentum now. So I'm pretty excited. Uh, let's invert things a little bit. And I know some of the others uh, besides me have questions for you guys. I want to start with, with some of you guys first and then I'll add my own questions. Uh, Let's start with SP. I know you have some questions. Okay. Um, Mike, I know you, you uh, said that one of the reasons you got into publishing is because you didn't see um, that much of the kind of thing you do and the kind of thing that you like to read. Um, I, I always like to ask um, people who are publishing what they feel is, uh, the, or that they describe as weird fiction. Um, what do you see as the main distinction between horror and weird fiction? Um, everybody has a slightly different answer, a different, a slightly different take on it. There isn't one final answer. So I was just curious to know uh, what you see as the main distinctions between horror and weird fiction and why you prefer or choose to emphasize weird fiction. Well, to me, um, a weird fiction has a sort of um, ambient sort of uh, dislocation or disconnection with reality. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, it could be ambiguous. It doesn't necessarily even have to have a plot, so to speak. Um, to me, um, it differs in horror fiction in that it doesn't, it, it can be quite ambiguous, can be plotless. And it's, it's almost more of a feeling, even though I know horror is, horror, uh, you know, is the one genre that is sort of driven by emotions. But to me, actually, um, 
uh, weird fiction is a is a feeling as well. And to me, there's it's no easy answer to this. I know I've done panels on this. Um, it's almost like the old um, "I'll know it when I read it" type thing, but it does have to me a, a separate vein that runs off that could be plotless. It's very ambiguous, and it it, it can compose science fiction, fantasy, um, ontological horror, psychological, Victorian, Gothic. Um, it can sort of weave in different genres, uh, but to me, it's sort of this sense of dislocation. There's this, everything's askew a little bit, and I know much of horror can do that too, uh, but horror is, to me, is sort of rooted in uh, fear, and, and, but weird fiction doesn't necessarily have to do that. It sort of has to give you that sense of uh, dislocation um, and, and something's askew. So, it is, I mean, they run on sort of pair lines at some point, but they, to me, verge off. And I like, I like weird fiction because I like, um, I like to be surprised. I like to feel that sort of um, strange place. It doesn't have to be scary all the time. It can just be fucking very strange. Um, at first, I, when I started publishing Shadows and Tall Trees, I wasn't even aware what I was publishing was weird fiction until people were telling me that's what I was publishing. I just thought it was sort of literary horror because that's what happened when I was sending stuff out uh, to markets. It was like, well, this is, I'd send it to a horror market be, because I had some of the tropes and people would say, well, this is too literary. And then, okay, well, I'd send it to a literary market and say, well, this is too horrific, that sort of thing. So there's that sort of um, really weird, you know, Dennis Etchison does that very well. He's kind of very literary horror writer, Brian Evanson, that sort of thing. And these are, these are the writers uh, I love. Um, so that's sort of how I got into publishing, I guess, weird fiction, even though I didn't know I was publishing weird fiction. Um, I'm also interested in knowing how you go about choosing the guest editors for uh, Year's Best Weird. Um, what do you look for in a guest editor? And how much does the guest editor influence the choice of stories? Do they read all of the stories? Or do you do the first cut and then they select, make the final decision? How do you, how do you go? What's that process like? Well, the guest editor thing to me is, um, was something I, I thought would be, uh, would not only um, make a year's best word fiction sort of different than all the other year's bests, uh, it would sort of set itself apart. The thing with, um, with doing something like this is that um, even though I love Ellen's books and Steve Jones and Paula's books, I think a guest editor brings a fresh take to every book. <clears throat> I, know, I know the editors don't play favorites and they say they don't play favorites. But they do have certain writers they go to because they like those writers and because they're fabulous writers. And if I was doing Year's Best Weird Fiction all by myself with no guest editor, I would be doing the exact same thing. There's certain writers I like who I would probably, you know, have they probably in the volume every year. It's just the way it goes when you're an editor. You, like, you have certain tastes, so you, you pick the same things. So to me, having a guest editor so the, is, an, is basically a way of giving you a fresh, different, book every year and every editor's take on it is different and I look when I look for an editor I look at someone who well basically like I, t I t Laird Barron was the first guest editor he was the first person I thought of to do the first one because at that point he was um, to me the most innovative weird fiction writer working at that time and probably still is even though he's branching into crime more but he's a fabulous writer fabulous guy so then I picked Kathy Koja who is uh, for the second volume, mostly because I think she is somebody who uh, in the past have been represented more in the horror, horror genre sort of. And I thought she'd have a very different take uh, on um, than Laird, Laird's. And, I, and I, was, it was, I was right. She, her take was more, Laird's is sort of more cosmic and horror. And Kathy's is more fables and sort of um, uh, fairies and, and different, very different um, book. And then, then I, again, the next one I went to Simon's because he has a very tick. He doesn't. He doesn't believe. He believes weird fiction is a form of horror fiction. And we've had this discussion many times. So I thought, well, I don't necessarily agree with him, but he might be a good guy to add it because I don't agree with him. So I, I look at. I basically look at the writers, uh, people I know who who have a good eye, people I know who I think would do a good job, and uh, basic. And I'm looking for people who have don't have my tastes, and that's part of the thing too. Because the way the process works is so everything is sort of filtered through my lens at first. So what I do is I take all the submissions, I read all the submissions, and I basically maybe 
eight to 10 stories a month I send to the guest editor. So over the year, they'll get probably 70, 80, 70 to 80 stories that I've chosen from the God knows how many I've read. Uh, but I also encourage them to, to read widely on their own. So, and they do. So I'll get, when I get the table of contents back, it'll be a mix of what they've read. And some of the stuff they've sent me, I haven't read. I Like the stuff they've, even though I've read so much, they have actually picked up other work that I have not seen. So that's how, that's, that's fabulous when I see that. So usually it's a mix half and half of stuff I've sent to them and stuff that they have picked up on their own. So that's basically how it works. Great. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, I know a lot of people are starting to get into publishing. And um, so this is kind of a business side question. Um, could you describe how you go about funding the anthologies? What sort of fundraising do you do? You do? What do you rely upon? How do you get started? <laughs> <laughs> it's basically my day job. Yeah. Uh, if I didn't have a day job, I wouldn't be able to do any of this. Um, so it's only actually in the last probably two years that the press has actually even made any money. Um, mostly, uh, as Mike knows, and many of you know, uh, when you do start a small press, um, it's a labor of love and uh, I don't necessarily think about the money side of it. What I wanted to do is actually just publish good stories. And that's all I do is short stories. I don't do novels or anything like that. Um, my focus is to champion the short story. And basically if I didn't have the day job to begin with, um, I wouldn't have, be able to do this. Um, but now in the last couple of years, enough people are buying the books and it's getting enough distribution that I am actually making some money. So anything I do make does go back into the press. I, I will always pay everybody on time. I, I pay the typesetter. I, I pay the artist. I pay the designer because uh, I want the books to look good. So I make sure that stuff is taken care of first because that's that's my priority. Have a, a good looking book. Uh, hopefully the insides are as good looking as good as the outsides, <clears throat> and basically hope, hope hope people buy it. So because my my thing is uh, you, you can judge a book by its cover. Well, I'm about halfway through um, Shadows and Tall Trees 7, and it rocks. Oh, it's thank you. just really great. Um, you, I mean, more fiction than you've published, I think, in past issues, and uh, past anthologies, and it's really, really good work. I, I also wanted to ask you, though, um, you, uh, this is a brilliant book. Thank Wonderful. Yeah. Um, SP's holding up uh, Aikman's, Aikman's Heirs. Heirs those, those and everyone yeah. who likes horror or weird fiction should have should own this book. Um, yeah, one that's Shirley Jackson. It is just great. It's great yeah. fiction. And um, so I wanted to ask you, who came up with this first? Did Simon approach you? Simon Strancis is the editor. Um, did he approach you and pitch the idea, or did you guys were you talking about something like this for a while? Um, I know Simon's big on um, Aikman, and he knows a lot about Aikman. And uh, so, how did that come about? How did the book begin? Well, Simon and I differ a little bit on the genesis of this. Um, it's a little fuzzy lunch conversation thing we had. Uh, I was having lunch one day with Simon and uh, Richard Gavin. And um, Simon had mentioned uh, that he had pitched a Aikman's Airs to another press. I was interested, but for whatever reason, it did not get off the ground. Uh, it's very fairly well-known press. And then... Um, he had sort of abandoned the idea and then he had come back to it. We were just talking about it. <clears throat> and he, he, when Simon pitched the idea to the other press, Simon didn't pitch it as he would be the editor. He just thought somebody has to do this book. Uh, like somebody had done, um, I think uh, Gary Fry's press had done Poe's Progeny um, a few years before. And Simon's idea was always to have a book um, in the mode of, of Aikman because there was enough uh, people this day doing Aikman-esque work. Uh, and when he pitched it to the other press, he pitched it just as an idea, as a concept. Uh, he didn't even want to edit it. In fact, he, he's a very reluctant editor. Uh, I had to beg him to do Aikman's Heirs and basically beg him to do uh, Year's Best Weird Fiction 3. Um, so when, we were, when he was telling me about this project, I thought it was a great idea. And, you know, Simon, to me, was the only person I thought of at that time who could be the editor. 
So I basically twisted his arm and uh, gave him a few bucks and said, go to it. And that's how it happened. So he, he's basically assembled and pitched the, the idea and concept and uh, gathered the writers. And fantastic book. In fact, fantastic book. It's, wonderful. it's my second best selling book. It is, it is a fantastic so. book. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and there was a party at a Necronomicon, and Simon was there. And there was a discussion that Laird and I had about, with Simon about you will do the book or <laughs> bad, <laughs> bad things will happen. Because yes. he was, he was beyond reluctant. It was a brilliant, as soon as he was talking about it, it was an absolutely brilliant idea. Um, he's so well versed in the subject and loved it too much that it would actually have been criminal if anybody else had attempted the project. And the book itself, cover to cover, speaks for itself uh, how much care as an editor um, he put into it. Um, the table of contents is to die for. Um, uh, if there's a worse story in the book, even that gets a rock solid A. Um, there's just too many stories. If you go down the table of contents, there's far too many stories in this particular anthology um, to list favorites. The whole table of contents almost turns into a list of, here, here's all my favorites. Yeah. Did an amazing job. The book looks incredible. You and he, and especially the writers, are to be commended. And much deserved that um, it won the accolades it won. Yeah, yeah, I can understand why Simon, you know, prefers to concentrate on writing fiction. Um, yeah. He's such a talented writer, and uh, the story in the new Shadows and Tall Trees uh, 7, his story is just heartbreaking. It's, yeah. it's really, really beautiful. Um, but I'm glad, I'm really glad that he took time out to yeah. do this because this is a classic. This is a classic yeah. book. And it's got a tall tree in it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Does somebody well, else want to jump in? I'm glad you're enjoying the book, though. Very much so. Uh, Very much I've so. got a couple of questions from the audience before they get off my screen here and I forget. Uh, <laughs> first question is, uh, Mike, is there a line that you won't cross in publishing weird fiction? Um. No, I don't think so. I don't think there's any line. I don't think there's any taboos. Uh, uh, in fact, the, the next book I'm doing, um, Mike O'Driscoll's uh, The Dream Operator, have a, has a couple stories in it that I think people are going to really talk about. Uh, maybe they're a little controversial, uh, but Mike's a terrific writer, really good, um, really good solid book, and uh, I think people will talk about these, uh, these stories. Yeah, to me, yeah, there's no, there's no real line. It's fiction. Um, I know it has a responsibility, but um, in, at the end of the day, to me, it's fiction. And if it's good fiction and it makes you think, then it's good. All right. And the other question from the audience was um, more on the business side. How do you distribute? What distributors? How did you develop that distribution? So all about distribution. Yeah. So basically, um, when I first started, it was strictly um, print. Well, actually, when I first started, it was um, limited runs, uh, Shadows and Tall Trees. The first couple were basically just, um, I printed it at a local printer, did 125 copies and just mailed them all out. Then I went to a lightning source, POD, um, for the next few. And um, so I, after, the, after the fifth one, I went to, I had a, a distribution deal with Cheesing Publications here in Canada. They're, um, they're good friends of mine. So I did two books with them. And so basically they got all, they got the books in the bookstores. Um, but because, because I'm a bit anal and because it's, it's difficult to run a, it was difficult for me to run the press on the, on the tight deadlines that they needed, like books years in advance for their distribution channels that I backed out of that deal. So I just did the two books with them. So now I'm back to lightning source. So it's print on demand. Uh, what I normally do now is I just do a, a very sort of small um, discount. So it, it gets into the Ingram channel. After the book's been published about uh, a year, I really discount it in the Ingram channel, and hopefully it gets into, into the, 
uh, bookstores that way. But I do, basically it's just print on demand. It's available online everywhere. Select bookstores whenever an Ingram client picks it up. Uh, but that's been few and far between, but uh, hopefully that'll pick up. And of course, uh, Kindle is essentially print on demand as well. What are your yeah. Kindle sales like compared to your print sales? Actually, they're very good. Uh, I get a steady in, um, I would say percentage wise, um, I think probably 35% of my sales are through the Kindle, 65% mm -hmm. uh, of uh, print. Um, but I do um, Kindle steady, very steady income, stable income from Kindle sales every month. I love it. It's interesting that you say that because I would say roughly the inverse for the books oh, yeah. that I've published, Autumn Cthulhu and uh, you know Jeff uh, Jeff's new book that I published. It's yes, uh, maybe two, two thirds uh, um, Kindle. Wow, so, wow. Yeah. In fact, in fact, my my ratio used to be even smaller. It used to only be about ten percent Kindle. It's it's steadily growing. Mm. So maybe 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 that'll keep growing. No, I'm just always curious if they, as long as they're reading the book, right? So exactly, that's, what, that's yeah, what's yeah. important. Yeah, Philip, I, you have a couple questions, I think. Yeah, I just on the continuing that conversation with Kindles. Um, are you doing? And if you've already doing it, and I've missed it, I apologize. Are you doing audiobooks of any of the uh, Undertow? No, I'm not. And the basic reason for that is I don't take audio rights. The basic reason is basically when I when I contract for a story, I take as little rights as possible. I take print and ebook rights for five years. I don't take anything else. So, uh, in fact, at one point I was going to go back and do um, ebooks and audiobooks of all the Shadows and Tall Trees um, early editions, but it got too cumbersome and, and a lot of people wouldn't give me the rights and stuff like that. So, I know it's easy enough. It's something I've been thinking about because um, a um, Steve uh, Berman at Lethe says he does very well with audiobooks. Uh, same with the um, the guys at Valancourt Books. They do very good with audiobooks. Right now, with how much I pay my writers, I don't want to take any extra rights from them. Um, I suppose I could build in some sort of royalty for the audio rights, and but it is something I'm thinking of. So I, I think perhaps down the road, as the press grows, Philip, I think that's something I will look at definitely. Yeah, and I'll I, tell you what, audiobooks are expensive. Yes. So so, yeah, well, I have, and I think a lot of people probably do this is you have the audible, you get like a membership and you pay X a month, you pay 15 bucks a month and you can pick whatever book you want. But, um, but yeah, I know it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to get into, uh, especially with your collections, with the single yeah. author collections, I could see it being beneficial. I just started the audiobook of my collection. I don't know how it's doing. I'll know in a couple of months, but, um, it's just nice to have the variety, I guess, for people who can't sit down and read. Um, yeah. That's why I'm asking about it. Um, or during the time, as it were. And then it actually segues into the Shadows and Tall Treats. I was going to ask you, I was wondering if, because I know the early, like you said, the early uh, volumes of Shadows and Tall Trees are, are gone, basically. And yeah. um, But I was wondering, are you, have you ever considered, or would you ever consider doing kind of a, a collection of the stories from the first five into a single standalone volume that could be purchased so people could access the stories from the first five? Um, I, it's something I did kick around, uh, and in fact, like um, volume one sold out quite fast, um, and that was in 2010. So I only took five years um, on the contract, so I would have to renegotiate the contracts to do anything like that. Um, it would depend if it was worth my while to actually do put the money into it and see how many people would actually be interested in doing it. I did kick around because because volume one was so limited. Uh, and I, people ask about it all the time still. Um, I did look into getting the rights to the stories, some of the stories back, but a, a couple of the authors wouldn't give me the rights. So it wasn't worth it to me to, to put out, you know, a partial volume one. Um, so the other thing with all this stuff, whether it's audio books or an omnibus collection or stuff like that, is basically it's, it's um, I'm at the point where the press takes up a lot of time but I do have a full-time job. So it's like I come home on nights and weekends work on the press. It's almost at the point where I need to get, I do have some people who help me obviously, but uh, our hiring staff and stuff like that. <clears throat> so it's one of these things, it'd be great to go full-time, um, but um, for now I have to keep the day job and uh, do four books a year and do the four books really well. 
I've done really well with my print subscription offer. I don't know if you probably know about it. That's what's um, basically offer four books for the price of three. If you buy the subscription at the beginning of the year, that sort of money helps me with seed money through the, through the rest of the year and um, carries me through. Um, so that, that's kicking around different ideas like that. Um, been looking at the audible stuff, but as Mike says, it is very expensive to sort of produce it. Although the Valancourt guys have, are, are giving me some um, advice on that. So we'll see down the road. I doubt there'll be any sort of omnibus shadows and tall trees collection just because of the, the trying to get the rights back to most of the stuff. Um, but there might be auto audible books in the future, but not this year, but probably next year. Cool. Mike, um, you know, you, you said you have favorite writers and you like, there are certain people you just love to work with. Um, that this, uh, this latest edition of Shadows and Tall Trees is an incredible mix of writers. It's just brilliant. And uh, there are some people here that I, that I have read many times and there are other people I haven't read at all. The author right. of the, the Water Kings... And yeah. uh, and uh, we can walk it off come the morning. I, I wasn't familiar with either of those authors, and uh, they're just terrific. So how do you go about? How do you make sure you don't um, become too narrow in your focus? Do you have an open submission period, as yeah. well as inviting people? How? Do, what is that process? Yeah. So with with shadows and tall trees seven, there was a initial. I send out an initial email to some writers I like. Maybe there was 15 writers who I invited specifically to get into the book. Uh, and I told them there's going to be an open call as well, though. Um, so I did do an open call, and I read for three months, and I got uh, 662 submissions, which I was hoping for 666, but maybe <laughs> next time. Um, so I did get, I did get uh, 662 submissions, and I did get uh, submissions from the writers I invited. Some of the writers I invited did not make it into the book. Some did. Um, so there was an open call, and um, some of the writers I was familiar with, um, SP, like you mentioned, um, uh, Malcolm Devlin's story. Um, we can walk it off come the morning. He's a, he's a very good writer. In fact, he's just got his first collection out. He's been published in Intrazone and Black Static. Uh, Unsung Stories in the UK has just published his first collection. Um, uh, we will grow into it, or we will grow into them, or something like that. Oh, he's going to kill me because I forgot it. But he's Malcolm Devlin, and he's also known as Vince Hag, who does all my uh, cover designs. So he's a very talented guy, uh, a real Renaissance guy. I'm very jealous and envious and uh, mad at him for that. But uh, he's he's brilliant. Uh, his collection actually is really really good, um, and we've taken actually. A story of his from Interzone last year for the year's best weird fiction volume four this year. Um, he's great. And the other story you mentioned, the water Kings, that's a new writer to me too. His name is man. Uh, he's a Singaporean writer who's based in Brooklyn. Uh, hang on um, a second, going, Mike. I think you, yeah. you cut out at least on my end. What was the name again? Oh, the name of the writer is Manish Melwani. Okay. Uh, he's from Singapore originally, but lives in Brooklyn now. And he's, um, this is only his second published story. Yeah, I was very happy to get it. That was me saying, wow. <laughs> you yeah, couldn't yeah, hear yeah. me. <laughs> this is what a story, The Water Kings. That was, that really blew me away too. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I love getting, I love getting a writer's uh, early stories. One of the uh, editions of Shadows and Tall Trees, I, um, volume four, I think I published Laura Morrow's first published story. I published Sonny Moraine's second published story. So it was good. So you read you read widely, and you are always looking for for new work. But you also have an open submission period, so you make new discoveries. Yes, absolutely. And I'm also looking for recommendations all the time for years' best weird fiction. So bring them on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's amazing how much stuff is out there that I don't see, even though I every two weeks I put out the call for submissions. There's so many stories. There's yeah. just so yeah. there's so much material out there. There's so much stuff being published. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, and I think I read in one of your introductions that uh, you even request things from publishers who never even respond to you. Yeah. Which I found flabbergasting. Yes, and I'm only asking for like a PDF or any digital file at all because that's what that's how I basically I read on the train in the mornings and that's how I keep everything organized. Um, right. Yeah, I just I never get a response from some of them. So 
which yeah, I don't understand either. But <laughs> there yeah. you go. We yeah. cannot. You don't, you don't want your 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 writer's story and uh, yeah, best word fiction. I know we can't consider it if we don't see it. That's for sure. As a as a writer, I've always found it a good idea to double check right. with Michael that my yep. publisher sent him something. He always lets me know. Yep. Thanks. Oh yeah. Feel free, everyone. Feel free to query. Michael, you mentioned uh, earlier. You, you kind of said um, short stories, but you, you're not interested in novels. Why is that? Just out of curiosity, why do you see novels being a a product that you'd be into moving forward? Um, it's mostly because uh, it's my personal aesthetic. I feel the short story is, is is like almost a perfect art form. It's one of those things I've always loved going back to the days when I was, would read Hemingway and uh, Shirley Jackson and um, Violet Paget and um, uh, John Cheever. Uh, I just, and Carver and Charles Beaumont. Um, I just love the short story so much. Uh, when I decided, like I, when I decided to start a press, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to champion short story. Um, it's funny in this day and age, you would think short stories would be more popular because people's attention spans seem to be dwindling, but um, it seems a battle to, to get anthologies made, get them published, get them out in people's hands. Uh, the big publishers don't want to do them. There's too much money involved, I guess, or too much risk and they don't sell. I've never understood that. I've never understood why anthologies don't sell, why magazines don't sell, while short fiction doesn't sell. Uh, that's not to say I may not publish a novel one day. Um, I read an extract from a novel um, um, last year from one of the writers I've published, a relatively new writer or unknown, uh, but uh, the extract just blew me away and she's polishing the novel. I may look at it. I may or may not make an offer on it, but right now my focus is short fiction. Um, but if I did, you know, if I did get the right book, I probably would publish it. Yeah, I don't know why that is about sh short stories versus novels. I know a lot of publishers and agents are really, really push hard for the novel, and, and even more so, they push hard for these serialized novels that seem to be the craze, is yeah. Knockout, Volume 1, you know, and, uh, and then you know, have 2 and 3 ready to go because people tend to buy these, these things in, you know, as serialized storylines. And it wasn't so, and I've been personally pressured to do that. And I, it's not something that interests me. It's not the kind of writing I do. It's, I, you know, I think of my stories as being very inclusive, but um, versus having a character that recurs over and over and over again. But, um, but it is interesting. It, it's a weird. It's a trend that seems to be picking up steam, especially with Amazon and eBooks. Uh, those you just see. There's like how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of fantasy and and uh, sci-fi and hard-boiled military, military series being cranked out at a pace that's hard to believe. Like once a month, <laughs> once or twice a month, these guys are just cranking out these e-books. But I, I agree with you. I think the short story is such a beautiful and perfect uh, form. And the, you know, even as far as going, as far as the novella and the novelette, I love, I personally think the novella is the perfect form for a horror story. Um, I love writing a 25,000 word horror story. I feel like I can do everything I can do in a novel without having to, you know, make the reader sit through 400 pages of 200 of which are backstory or side story. Right. So I agree yeah. with you on that front. Yeah. And it makes you wonder all those, all those uh, books that are being cranked out, uh, the quality of them. Um, that's why I love the short, short form because you can read it in one sitting, you know, the author has taken the time to make this as best they can it may have taken them as long as to write some novels. Uh, I know for a fact, if you read uh, In Shadows and Tall Trees, the, the, the latest volume, volume seven, the second story in the book is by Mary Rickard. And she's a tremendous writer. I've got a Mary Rickard story for you, actually. You guys will love this. She, she worked on that story for seven years. And it, was, it wasn't until I invited her to the book that she took the impetus to actually sit down and finish the book, it, uh, finish the story. But it's a story she'd been working on off and on for seven years. And that's just how long that story took. So. And it's perfect. So that's what I love about short fiction. You can, you know, I can sit on the train and read a story. It'll break my heart and, uh, or, it'll, or, it'll, or it'll make me mad or, or it'll make me sad or angry or whatever. 
Um, and I love that. I love that I can just read something in 20 minutes and get that. So I'll always love short fiction. So. Any other questions, Phil? No, I don't stop my head. Okay. Uh, that, I, that sort of makes me want to ask you, Mike. That yep. said, uh, do you have any personal favorite weird fiction novels or novellas that you've read? Anything come to mind? Um, I, I go back to Kubin. Um, the name of his novel is Alfred Kubin. What's the novel? The Other Side. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joe. That's that's one of my favorites. Um, I love the early work of, um, well, it's just more short fiction, was um, uh, Vernon Lee's work, Violet Paget. Um, most, most of the stuff I read does tend to be the shorter lengths. Um, in fact, once I, once I started reading for the year's best weird fiction, um, I don't actually read much many novels or novellas at all, because my my upper word length for the book is seventeen thousand five hundred. So basically, I just keep everything I read all the time now, and I don't have time to read anything else really. Uh, is is short fiction? So yeah, being an um, editor will do that. You have yeah. little time for any other reading. Yeah, yeah. But Kafka, Kafka has been a favorite of mine too. Uh, all, all Kafka's work I love. All right. Who else has questions for Mike? Joe, I, know I have you a question. Do. Yeah, go ahead, Kelly. Um, Mike, you made the decision to, uh, to go from a, kind of a literary journal with the essays and everything and then went straight to anthology. Was there something that people were giving you feedback on that they didn't like that because I really loved the essays. Yes. So I was, um, in fact, Kelly, I had, um, I was doing essays and reviews like film reviews, book reviews and little essays in, in the journal. Um, all the feedback I got was that people wanted the fiction. Um, but, and, and, and in fact, I think I had one, one, one person say they loved the, um, uh, the uh, movie reviews because uh, they were kind of snarky, which is kind of fun. Um, yes. And, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I, a bit to your point, I've been approached. Um, I don't actually, I don't even know if I can say this yet. Uh, I may be publishing a book next year um, by some, um, some well-known uh, editors and um, in, in the weird fiction horror community who uh, looking to start this new publication called the silent garden. God, if, if they're listening, they'll kill me probably. Um, oh, don't worry. The word will not get out. Yeah, yeah. Nobody listens so, to this. Yeah. But they, they were, yeah, they were going to publish the, publish it themselves, but then they decided that then they approached me about it because they thought I could give the, the journal uh, a bit of a street cred right away. So we're, we're in talks now. So it looks very much like I will be doing that. Uh, it's an exciting project. Uh, basically it is, uh, to Kelly's point, a bit more like what I was doing with Shadows and Tall Trees in the first place. Uh, it'll be it'll be fiction. It'll be translated fiction. It will be reviews. It will be showcasing art. It will be it will be a similar, I guess, to Wormwood and uh, Weird Fiction Review um, in that sense. Um, so I haven't seen it yet. It's just sort of uh, in the talks. It's something they're putting together. Uh, and well, even if I don't publish it, they will probably publish it. So we'll see it out there probably next July or something like that. So it's just it's formative, formative at the time being. So, but it's always I, good to be approached for street cred. I'm guessing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll see. These are very well known editors, so we'll see. It, it's an exciting project. So, when you say by next July, do you mean this July? Only a couple months away? No, no, no. It's, they're just putting it together. Their, their timeline is basically um, uh, next July to have the finished product printed. Kelly asked, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's basically something has, that has just come up that they, they have kicked around for a while, apparently, and uh, approached me about. So uh, exciting, though. All right, we're on the subject of Kelly Young. What the hell is that on your screen, Young? Former What's that? prosecutor. I, I just felt that might give me a little more gravitas when I Street ask cred. a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it working? Well, yes. he answered your he answered your question. He didn't say, "Who are you?" Shit. So. Yeah. 
<laughs> Look, that doesn't fly in my court, Mike box Davis. To lemonade, Kelly, and it'll start to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to start advertising an Airbnb on my. I'm going to put a banner up there. If we can say anything we want, fine. Yeah. Well, essentially, the uh, Google Hangout banners are working again, I take it, since half of you have them up. So. <laughs> That's right. I didn't even know we could do that. I didn't know this was a, a you, you can't. You have to pay money for that. No. no well, I'm not as far as you know, that. you have to pay me money for that. <laughs> I don't know what I would put anyway. <laughs> Drunkard. Authors are usually good. Yeah. yeah. So should, should I tell you my Mary Rickert story? Sure, why not? Yeah. Uh, is, is everybody aware of Mary Rickert? You I am not. No, I'm sorry. Okay. I've only read a couple stories. Yeah, so she, she, she hasn't published widely. She, she published a novel last year, and she's published mostly um, the year before Small Beer Press put out her c collection, uh, and she's published mostly in fantasy and science fiction. One of my favorite writers, uh, her work is always nominated for awards and in year's best things when she does write, but she's not very pro prolific or fast. So when I was doing my, um, one of the first, the first book basically with um, uh, my press, Apparitions, I approached Mary uh, for a story because I'd read one or two of her stories in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. It was just blown away. So I approached her. I had very, very little money, uh, actually no street credit at all. This was going to be my first published uh, book under the press. <laughs> and she, she said, sure. I will, I will write you a story. So she, um, very slow writer. So she did not actually get the story done. So done in time. Um, but that story she wrote was called journey to the kingdom. And when she did finish it, uh, it was published in, um, the magazine fantasy and science fiction. Then it won the, um, uh, world fantasy award. Um, so when I approached her again, this time for another story, and we've been in touch uh, basically um, through the years, every now and again, chatting because I love her work. She's had two collections out. You should both, you should, everyone should seek them out. She, um, she had basically written the story for Shadows and Tall Trees 7, started it around that time I was asking her about the other story because she felt bad for me for not finishing the other story in time and knew that if I ever asked her again, she should start a story then. So she had been working on this story for me for seven years, and then she sent it to me. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so she's, she's aces in my books. <laughs> you spent some quality time reading that story. Reading that story. Yes. And actually, Philip, you'll probably enjoy the first two stories in, that, uh, in the anthology because they're sort of film related. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Brian Evanson's story and uh, Mary's story, yes. Yeah, I read Brian's. Yeah, he's great. I know I he's always great. Yeah, yeah, he's such a. He's yeah. It, it, it drives me crazy how talented oh, yeah. he is. Yeah, I know. And I, I he's think, nice. Makes it all yes. that much worse. It does. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot hate him. I know. <laughs> Actually, what do you have? That's a really that's a fairly good description description of uh, Phil Fragasi. He's talented and nice. Oh, yeah, thanks. unlike a lot of people, talented yeah. but not nice. Um, we do not hate him. Uh, Michael, I was going to ask you what you, you mentioned the subscription, uh, and I did, which yeah. I, which I was, uh, which I was a subscriber to last year. I haven't yeah. re resubbed. I have to do that. But I was wondering what you have coming up. What other four you books you have coming up? I know you have the collection and you have the New Year's Best. What else is on the? Yeah. So yeah. Thanks. I just published Shadows and Tall Trees Seven. Uh, in July, I will be publishing The Dream Operator by Mike O'Driscoll. Mike is uh, one of these writers. He's from Wales. He's been published. Uh, Ellen Datlow has published him a number of times. Uh, he's been published in the magazine Fantasy and Science Fiction. He's one of these writers that flies under the radar because he's not that prolific, but is all terrific writer. So I've got that book coming out. Uh, Helen Marshall has delivered the year's best weird fiction volume four. Uh, that'll be out in October. Uh, and so the final and fourth book also in October is a, another British writer by the name of Conrad Williams. And um, his collection is called I Will Surround You. And that's another fantastic book. I love Conrad Williams. His book one was just amazing. He has a great, great story in this uh, in in Shadows and Tall Trees 7. 
Yeah. I got to pick that really, up. Another, another really heartbreaking story. Um, mysterious, beautiful, uh, just bittersweet, strange. It, it's yeah. very, very moving. I've got, a, I've got a story about his story, too, if you want to hear it. Sure. <laughs> so basically, I read that story in, in a book that was supposed to come out last year. Um, it was um, a book that was long in the works. Um, the editor sent me a PDF, said, oh, yeah, this is going to be published in, in um, you know, October 2016. Um, so I read that. In the, in the book, I read that story by Conrad and was blown away by it. Uh, the book never did get published, and it still hasn't been published. So I approached Conrad um, when I was doing the open call. I said, listen, this is a Shadows and Tall Trees story if you want to send it. He had been in a previous volume of Shadows and Tall Trees. So he said yes um, and sent it, and that was it. So I got lucky. <laughs> An editor has to be good and lucky. Joe and Mike know that. Yeah, that's yeah. very true. Yeah. Yeah, so luck, ha luck has a little bit to do with it. But, yeah. but it, it's, it's also vision, and you, you have – Stunning vision. You know, when you look at the product that you've overseen as publisher, um, the, the, the list of accolades um, is quite envious. Um, uh, but you got you got a really good eye for Who's doing? You mentioned Mary Rickard. Yeah. I've read, I think, four things by her. Yeah. Um, all brilliant, utter, utterly brilliant. Yeah, um, she's fabulous. Uh, you know, you you published V. H. Leslie. Yeah. Another. It's like wow. Yeah. Um, Strands is who I hate. He's he's yeah. useless. I hope somebody runs him over six or seven <laughs> times. Well. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he, he does what I'm unable to do as a writer. I, I just, I read Stranzis and it's like, fuck can I do that? You know? Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you have a yeah, fantastic, fantastic sense of, of who's doing things. Um, I, I know this new edition of Shadow and Tall Trees, Excited to see Levy, Brian yes. Evenson can yeah. do no wrong. I mean, since the wavering knife, I thought this guy's an absolute magician. No, no matter how you look at it, um, Rosalie Parker, I think. Oh is yeah, tremendous! Oh. What a magical wow. story in, in, fact, in yeah. this edition. What a magical story. and strange and beautiful story. Yeah, it's yeah, one of the shortest is. in the book, and I think it's a real gem of a story. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it yeah. surely is. Yeah. I've um, read quite a few of her stories and this, this one really, I, she's always wonderful, but this really yeah. stands out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, again, want to commend you for what well, you're doing. You, it just, and, and, and I appreciate and, it. And weird fiction review, I think is a genius idea. Mm -hmm. um, really is. Um, I, I was over the moon to see when you picked Kathy Koja for an editor. Um, yeah. Well, you've been picking great editors all along. Yeah. Um, and, and I completely agree to have this rotate, have these rotating editors give, gives the book, the books, this expectation level. And unlike sometimes, where we encounter expectation levels and we're severely disappointed. The great thing I think you're doing is we see these table of contents, our expectation levels ratchet up, and then the product's delivered. And I think you're consistently exceeding those lover, th those expectation levels. Um, and oh, and can't wait to see what else you're going to do. Um, because you're doing an amazing job. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I mentioned Robert Shearman's doing volume five. I probably mentioned it. Yep. 
Yep, sure did. Yeah, you did. Great, great choice. That's that'll be interesting. Yeah, and volume six and seven. Volume six and seven are already sort of spoken for too, but nothing signed yet, so I don't want to say too much. Yeah, cool. Now, nope, like I said, you're doing doing a great job. Yeah, and next year's lineup. Next year's lineup is also sort of set. Uh, I, I've already mentioned the first book. I can mention that one because the contract signed. I'm doing Priya Sharma's first collection, and she's a fabulous writer. Yeah, that'll that'll be great. Yeah, very good. Yeah, she's terrific. Joe, while you've got the floor, what what questions do you have for Mike? Most everything's pretty much been gone over. Yeah, um, it has, hasn't it? It it really has. I mean, basically, I just wanted to chime in to say that. What an incredible press this is. Um, uh, you know, well, there's a, we're, we're very fortunate. There's, there's a, a number of good presses going on now. So there we, Oh yeah. I mean, we're, we are living in a, a renaissance yeah. for this material. Um, yeah. and, sure. and, and you are certainly one of the torch bearers. Um, thank you so much. It's, and I'm glad to see you focused on, what you're focused on. Um, uh, the strange and the weird. Yeah, the numius is like, we need more yeah, of that, sure. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, and, have, and I have to say, I was absolutely over the moon that you mentioned Kuban. Kuban yes. is spectacular. Yeah. Um, anybody who hasn't read The Other Side needs to yes. jump on Amazon instantly. Incredible artist as well. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. um, and, and, and his short work is not to be overlooked at all. No, um, absolutely. I, I think even the Vandermeers in the, in the Weird yes. included at least one Kuban. Yeah. Um, just a brilliant, brilliant writer that we do not hear enough about. I mean, we barely hear about. Um, yeah. I, mean, I mean, in this setting where you get a bunch of writers who are really into the weird yeah they're, they're, that's a name that comes up but I don't think readers are getting getting the exposure um, that they that they should be absolutely is um is anyone now going to Providence for Necronomicon this year oh yeah I'll be there okay yep. uh, we'll be there oh yeah Phillips cool. got his hand up yeah, Matt, I know Matt will be there uh, yeah. Kelly's too good for us he won't be there <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, so we've been we've been invited as a publisher guest of honor, so we're going to be there and oh, uh, come say hi, and uh, we'll have a little bar con. Uh, well, this will be this will be my first Necronomicon. This I don't I never I went to StokerCon recently, and that was the first convention I've ever gone to. So this was my first. We'll make sure that you get initiated. Properly. I want to get properly initiated uh, yes. <laughs> without the hazing, though. Yeah, no, I don't think there's any chance of that. Uh, no, whoa, 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 whoa. No haz hazing is a part of it. Yeah. Philip, we will, summon, we will summon the elder gods. Right. Um, as long as the hazing is alcohol related, I'll probably be okay. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, uh, Rick, do you guys have any questions? Well, I guess um, this is more just a gestalt. Um, Charlie Strauss, uh, you know, publisher of the Laundry series, uh, is very much down on the future of book publication. That, um, in particular, like mass market follow-ons to say mid-list hardcovers is just about done in, um, just sort of evaporating. And yet, uh, and, and the other thing is, we have all seen really nice weird fiction presses come and go over the last 10, 15 years, where you just, they go, they have a run. I was just wondering, how are uh, you guys feeling pretty sustainable right now? I mean, uh, you're already plotting ahead to volume seven. I, I guess sales have to be going well. Yep, right now, um, it's, it's the same plan. I'm doing four books a year. As I sort of alluded to Philip there, uh, I'm sort of at the point where I have to decide if I'm going to do more books, I need to hire some people. Uh, because I do work 40 hours a week, plus there's an hour travel. So it's 10 hours each day. 
that I'm impressed. Um, so right now, yeah, we're, we're, we're making some money. Uh, people are, are noticing the press. Uh, I do have people who help me. My daughter helps me. My wife helps me. Vince Hag is my art director. Uh, I have um, Robert Freeman Wexler who does all my typesetting. And I basically have a lot of friends like you folks who help spread the word. Uh, so right now, I mean, there's full steam ahead. But what I've always done and what I will always continue to do is go slow. Because so many presses make the mistake. Um, they just jump in full steam ahead. And they don't have a business plan. They don't have any plan at all. Um, like in 2009, when I was nominated for the Shirley Jackson Award for the first book I did, um, I could have just said, hey, this is easy. Let's go ahead and do four of those books right now. But I didn't. I just did another book the next year after that. I'm a very conservative and cautious person when it comes to my money. So that's, that's my plan is to do keep doing that and just keep hoping the, the press builds from there. So if it comes to a point where I do have to hire more people, then I think that's a good thing. So, Rick, do you have a question or two? Yes. Uh, since you did it, Aikman's Heirs, is there any other uh, departed master of the weird fiction who you would like to do a tribute to? I'd like to do Aikman's Heirs too. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we probably could do that. Aikman's Heirs, uh, the return. That's right. Yeah. Uh, no, not really. I mean, um, Gary Fry did post progeny and, and Simon had an idea for Aikman's heirs. Um, um, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it that much to tell you the truth, Rick. Um, but maybe now you've got me thinking about it. Maybe Kafka or let's do a Shirley Jackson book for Christ's sakes. Right. Yeah. Oh, Shirley yes, Jackson. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God! Now I'm going to have to do it, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think probably so. No. I think that would be a great book. Is this an announcement? <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I will let you know, though. Okay, you know we're going to start bugging you about I it now. No, I know, okay. I know, so, I know. In fact, yeah. So the publication schedule is full, full to, up to 2019. So it'll, it'll probably be 2019 if I could do it. So, but. The thing with anthologies is there's so much work, but it's, it's work yes. I love doing. So single, single author collections are a bit easier because you've got the one author. Um, anthologies, especially the year's best weird fiction. This last one was so much work, basically just getting the rights to all the stories because um, a lot of them are from literary and big houses. So you have, to, you have to go somewhere to get the North American rights. Then I have to go somewhere else to get the European rights. Uh, then I have to go somewhere else to get the electronic rights. So it's been a bit of a nightmare getting all the rights to it. And it's taken up a lot of time, uh, which has put me behind on other stuff. But um, um, I do love doing anthologies. And uh, Shirley Jackson, well, what's the, what's the title? What's the title? We have, we're going to have to come up with a title. We have always lived in the house. <laughs> That's right. Because we all, all, we're all our children, and we have. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's in my brain now, so thank you. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Rick, do you have another question? <laughs> no, I'm done. Okay. Well, I'll shoot, if everybody else is done, I'll shoot a couple of questions your way, Mike. Um, sure. I did ask you about your favorite weird fiction novels, uh, yeah. but those aren't your first love. Short stories are. Yeah. Can I ask what maybe a few of your, even if it's just one or two of your favorite yeah. classic weird fiction tales would be? Yeah, and actually, I don't, you know, I don't even know if you'd classify these as weird fiction, but um, I love Charles Beaumont's fiction. I don't know if anyone's aware of his fiction. Philip might be, as he's a Hollywood guy. Oh yeah. Anyways, yeah. he um, he wrote oh, a yes. number. Yeah, he wrote a number of uh, fantastic. Sh he was a writer for Twilight Zone too. He was right. in the Bradbury and Dennis Etchison circle. He um, William F. Nolan kn knew him. He was a very good writer who died at the age of 37. Um, but one of his stories is called Miss Gentle, Be Gentle Bell. It's is a very heartbreaking and harrowing story. Um, and it's, it's one of those stories that has always stuck with me. Um, Shirley Jackson's uh, The Summer People. Oh, geez, what else off the top of my head? Uh, Peter Straub's... Um, 
Oh, well, what's the one with the blue in the title? Anyone remember? Oh. Anyways, Peter Straub and um, just, oh, I, off the top of my head, Mike, you've put me on the spot. I can't what think about it. Uh, there, there has to be an Aikman in there. Yes. In my brain does that all the time as well. So. Yes. Um, uh, which Aikman, though? I can't, I can't pick one Aikman, though. There's a lot of them. I know. I know. There is too many. <laughs> you know, at the Ligotti beginning. as well. The, the Red Tower. Ligotti's Red, the Red Tower. One of my favorites. Uh, at the beginning, Mike, SP did ask you about the differences, in your opinion, between horror, general horror, and weird fiction. Yeah. But I don't think we really discussed the question that I know you get asked all the time, but we may as well ask it here and end up uh, finalized with this question is, what is weird fiction? And in, and as you said in one of your introductions, if you ask, I don't know what it was, you said a dozen people, you get a do dozen different answers. But what, yes. what would your answer be? Um, it's basically a probably a subset of pulp fiction, um, fiction that sort of subverts the laws of nature, um, not necessarily horrific, but can be, but it can be um, uh, psychological, ontological, um, can basically, um, I don't know, it's basically, to me, is it, sort of speculative, but not really horrific in nature. So a lot of the stuff I publish, uh, like uh, in Shadows and Tall Trees, it's very literary minded, very sort of um, uh, psychological in nature, and is speculative, but it doesn't necessarily have a plot, doesn't necessarily lead anywhere, doesn't necessarily have any neat uh, resolution. But when you read it, it does leave you feeling like you've, you've read a story. Even like Michael Sisko's work, for instance, is weird fiction. Every time I read a story of his, it's like, holy shit, this guy's fucked up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I love yeah, it. Yeah, but fu fucked up and brilliant. And brilliant, yes. yes. There's, more of a, brilliant. there's more of a sense of personal journey um, and sometimes an internal uh, journey than an emphasis on action in the sense of physical adventure. Uh, in in the stories that you publish, it seems to me, there's a yeah. there's a real emphasis on human consciousness and layers of memory and time and what it really what, the experience of a life rather than you know necessarily overt physical action. Although you know uh, there is action and there is right. structure uh, certainly. Uh, these are yeah, the journey talented. Is, yeah. There is a journey, but it's more of a um, more of an internal monologue. More mm -hmm. of a, um, it's not a physical journey; it's a mental journey that most of the protagonists go through. Mm -hmm. um, and that, to me, is the most interesting fiction. Is not necessarily action-driven fiction. Um, in fact, yeah, I don't think I even publish that much fiction that is action-driven. Come to think of it. it, it's more it's more internal stuff, more um, uh, monologue-driven, that sort of thing. Um, but more to the point, yeah, I mean, weird fiction to me is this sort of um, speculative fiction, kind of pulpy in some ways, but not necessarily horrific. Um, it has that sense of dislocation. Um, Kafka does it well. Cisco does it well. A uh, number of writers, Mary Rickert, Rickert does it well. Um, the horror, if there's horror in these stories, it seems to me to have more to do with um, grief and change and loss and loss, trans yeah. transformation. Yeah. Uh, in abandonment, transformation, mm -hmm. grief. Those are, those are themes that run through the stuff I publish all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I mean, even then, um, that's sort of just my aesthetic and my taste. I think there's weird fiction that, that sort of is more, a little more, um, maybe adventurous than that, um, uh, but my, my sort of aesthetic leans towards the sort of dark and the bleak and the sort of um, um, personal journeys that could be, you know, the funny thing is whenever, whenever I publish a book and my wife reads a story, she, at the end she goes, they're all dead, aren't they? I said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> they could be. So maybe that's our definition. They're all dead, maybe. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Blue Rose, David Del Cole, one of my that's listeners. Right, yeah. Blue Rose. Yeah, yeah. Thank Blue you. Blue Rose, that's the uh, story with the kid who hypnotizes his brother, I believe. Yeah, oh my God. Oh, yeah, it's horrible. horrible. It's my, it is horrible. Story. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And Peter's I was going 
I was going to also mention, just because I hate to have a conversation about weird fiction without saying Reggie Oliver, because right. he's, he's one of my favorites. Yeah. I know he's been battered around in a few of these anthologies. He's, he's, he's amazing. Oh, he's one of my favorite writers just too. I was fortunate enough to publish one of his stories in Early Shadows and Tall Trees. And um, I actually met him over in Brighton, England. And uh, as you would expect, a true gentleman. Really, yeah. really nice guy. He's a wonderful artist and a, yeah. a playwright, I believe, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. And yeah. an actor. Yeah. And an yeah, actor as well. Yeah. yeah. Same with Robert Shearman, who's a playwright, and Robert was an actor as well. So, well, Robert's I mean, a good example of a weird fiction writer whose stuff gets really dark and sometimes violent. And probably, is, at least to me, this is what I've read of his. I've read his collection. It seems to me he, he rides that fine line between weird and kind of straightforward horror a lot of times. He's kind of pulpy, yeah. almost, you were saying earlier. Yeah. Weird. And so also, I'm interested also, to see what he'll pick. Also, he's got a very dark sense of humor. So that's, I guess, I guess I think that's probably what I'm trying to say. Is yeah. that he, he's especially and hard to categorize, especially yeah. hard yeah. to describe because it's such a such a an unusual focus. Yeah, you know, he, he always comes up with something that I, I haven't seen anybody else do. Yeah, I mean, there was a story about Hitler's dog, and there was a story about furniture giving birth to other furniture. Uh, <laughs> when I read his stuff, I'm like equally horrified, and then the next paragraph, I'm laughing at something. And he, he's, he's just brilliant that way. So um, He's got that wrist use mentality yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, those guys, those guys are interesting. Yeah, yeah. And Riz, Riz is another guy who doesn't get very much uh, press, but is a very good writer. Yeah, I've been lucky to be in a couple. I, I absolutely of, agree. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been lucky to be in a couple of books with him this year, so I'm looking forward to those coming out. Yeah, yeah. He's very prolific, but he's very good. Well, Mike, thank you for being on the show. It was great oh, talking Mike. with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate, really appreciate it. it. Uh, Year's Best Weird Fiction, you can pick it up. at. at uh, is it best to go to your website for the print version or just go to yeah. Amazon? What should people do? Yep, yeah, you can come to the website. I get more money that way, but um, right. you can go. And your website is undertowpublications.com, is that right? Undertowbooks.com. Undertowbooks.com, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I was going to do Undertow Publications, but then I thought, that's a bit lengthy. <laughs> yeah, you want to make it easy to type That's into right. that, that part. Right. There. <laughs> that was smart. Uh, Undertowbooks.com, and yep. you can get them all there. So, Cheers, Mike. Uh, great, thanks, yes. great publishing. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, it was, Mike. All you have to do is close your browser, Mike. and I'll kick you out of here. Thanks, thanks Michael. Thanks, thanks Michael. guys. Bye-bye. See ya. See ya. Take Thank care. you. Take care. All right. Did you find it? No. Or, or if uh, we're gonna st we're gonna talk about Stephen King, you're welcome to stick around for that too. <laughs> I'm heading out for dinner. Okay. <laughs> Have a good dinner. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Um. All right. That was interesting. Great guy. I I found it interesting that uh, he's a fan of Charles Beaumont, who I always think of like a Twilight Zone writer and a writer for films in the 60s. You know, I never really got into his short fiction that much. He, uh, he adapted Charles Dexter Ward into the Haunted Palace. Right. Plus the seven faces of Dr. Lau. Right. But that Haunted Palace screenplay is, is pretty great. It's, it's more done with horror than Charles Dexter Ward, if you were so it. Sure, but They're still done, good. Done very well. Done very well. It's not, I mean, it's... Also, how cool is it that uh, we might have spawned a Shirley Jackson anthology right here? <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> it's been needed for quite a while. Yes. It's one of those, it's one of those things it's on my overdue. fantasy list. It, it's overdue. It's oh, overdue. Oh, boy, That's is happen. it ever. And, and I, can all, I can envision a table of contents for that puppy. <laughs> um, that's, it's, it's, it's been number one on my fantasy list for quite a while. Just a question. I, I've only read The Lottery and The Haunting of Hill House. What, uh, other works by her would you recommend? 
Well, I'm going to, I, there's a really easy way to get into her short fiction and it's a very, very short story, but I think it's a masterpiece. There's a little story called The Witch about a woman on a train with her children and a man who approaches them and starts telling stories. And it's, it's just the best. I read it every once in a while and I am in awe. Um, I think we can get that online. I'll uh, post the link. Okay. Uh, Kelly, you want to talk about this announcement for Lovecraft Country? Uh, sure. What do you want to talk about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fact Jordan, that it's happening. Jordan Peele, the writer, director, producer of Get Out has been tapped to executive produce with J.J. Abrams a series based on the novel Lovecraft Country by, is it Matt Ruff? Matt Ruff, yeah. 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 I just started reading this, and I am into it. I am so into this book, but I just I just started uh, like yesterday. So. Okay, that's cool to know. I have not read the book, but um, being a fan of Get Out – I'm definitely I'm a looking big forward fan to say, what, what do you what do you think of Lovecraft oh. Country, Matt? Matt? Okay, well, it's it's complicated because it's several books all in one. You, you know, it's not just a weird fiction book. It's a, a commentary. Um, how did uh, African Americans respond to years of oppression? by basically creating essentially a parallel society. Like, uh, if you won't let them go to your resorts or your hotels, they had a publication. Uh, this was real, and it was adapted in this book, that listed places that were welcoming or treated people like human beings, uh, regardless of the color of their skin, or they could go... They, they could go fill up their gas tank and use the bathroom and get a sandwich without getting harassed, uh, beat up, refused. And so, uh, and I, you know, they, they, they're those historically black colleges, which are basically a response to, okay, you won't let us have our own, you won't let us participate in the intellectual discourse, we'll have our own, and who needs you? You know, so... The part of this uh, book is an expression of that rage uh, and using it as a response to, say, racism in um, weird fiction that was pretty rampant when Lovecraft was writing. So the main characters are, in some way or another, affiliated with a publication modeled on this real publication, and they they send out people to uh, either find places to go that they could rate or review, they could include in their book that was well known amongst uh, African Americans, who could then use it to travel with a minimum of fuss. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, so there's that part of it, and that part is really great, and that rings true. And it lends a very good um, foundation to the rest of the book. Okay, so now the rest of the book is you take these, I, you know, you remember um, in uh, Tales Out of Dunwich, Robert Price included a book that he said was one of the basis of the Dunwich horror. I forget what it was. It was a lycanthropy story about, yeah, the thing, okay. It, there was terrible racism in this story. I mean, to the point where it's like, I'm squirming when I'm reading it, okay? Uh, well, that was in a lot of pulp fiction at the time, that if the white guy just speaks roughly to the uh, black man, the black man will naturally do what he says because he knows his place and who his better is. Okay, well, that's, that's not Lovecraft country at all. Lovecraft country is you've got these people who are competent, who are respected in their own intellectual ways, and don't have time for uh, this kind of behavior by white people because who needs it, right? Um, 
And so now you put this kind of person into the middle of a weird fiction novel. Do you see what I mean? And this is how are they going to respond to the way that they get treated, which is the typical way someone a weird fiction novel in the 30s would treat someone of African-American descent. I don't know if I'm like blabbering on at the mouth, but this is kind of making sense. Okay, so kind of. you, you have the response uh, to the racism by people who are forced to live in a racist society that was even more overt than today. And then you have, let's just say, the basis of the weird story. Uh, the summoning, the magic, the uh, creepiness factor. And whereas I really like the foundation and the underpinnings, in my view, the actual weird fiction story was, it was good, it was okay, it wasn't great. You see what I mean? Uh, so yeah. I, I enjoyed it, but... It, it, in some ways, it was like reading um, The Drums of Chaos by Richard Tierney. Where I'd say, boy, the amount of effort this guy put in to create this world was really amazing. And, it, and it's a window into a place I've never seen. And I really like that part about it. But then when you actually get into the, the, the story itself, I, I hope that they can make it more compelling television than it was to me as a story. Do you see I guess, what I mean? I guess when I hear Lovecraft Country, I think of um, the actual topography of Lovecraft stories, Massachusetts and and Maine. And I'm – is that not at all where this is taking place? Not exactly. Uh, you know, the thing is I read this book when it first came out. And when was that? Like, hell, it could have come out two weeks A couple ago. Years. Memory shot. A couple okay. of years, I think. They, they they go into um, by chance they go into uh, an area which is essentially held like a medieval fief by this family, but it's not um, Dunwich, Innsmouth, Arkham, or anything like that. I think the Lovecraft Country refers to uh, two things. One is the sense that you're going into this uh, isolated area where um, weird going ons are happening like you often have in a Lovecraft story. But more broadly, it refers to the fact that you're going into a world where your kind is not welcome. Uh, do you see what I mean? Sure, okay. Look, really, all I need to know is, does Cthulhu show up or not? Um, <laughs> I mean, you're thinking of Stranger Things. <laughs> you know, Otto, it's interesting to me. what you're saying is really fascinating, Matthew, because um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that was so compelling about Get Out was the way in which it was demonstrated that white people have created this bizarre parallel universe, okay, of whiteness. <laughs> and um, so that, that was very, very interesting to me. I, I'm really enjoying the book so far. I'm, I'm not very far into it. Like I said, I just started reading yesterday. But I, I, will be, I will be can very... Can I just say, though, SP, how much does, how much does uh, this really have to do, the book, as opposed to the TV show, have to do with each other? Because executive producing something is a long way away from directing. I, I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's just basically, if you're, if you, I mean, producing, I meant, not executive producing. If you're producing something, basically it means that you're paying for it, Correct. It doesn't really mean in much of anything else. Okay, no, I don't well, want doesn't it mean that you that you organize that you were one of the people organizing the funding for it? Maybe you pay for it. Am I correct, Phil? I'm not sure about that. As far as Jordan Peele's role is concerned, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. No, he's he's being paid to. Sure, and he's probably and she's probably sure he's probably acting as showrunner. And the other thing you have to remember about these uh, things okay. is well, that answers that question because. Yeah. yeah, you bring in somebody creative like that to kind of oversee the writing. Uh, but doesn't but know. doesn't the executive producer's name sort of bring in more of the funding? Then isn't that one of the one of the, the often of a name executive producer? Oftentimes, executive producer is uh, yeah, that is the person who is funding the film. Uh, the producer tends to be the person who is actually dealing with the day to day 
you know, lines producing, balancing the, the you know, the, the, the spending and versus the budget. Um, right. And, but sometimes an executive producer like Jordan will get that title, uh, like a Jason Blum would get a title like that because uh, they're basically putting, bringing him into the top level. So they're giving him more authority than just being the showrunner. So it's just like a- And his name on the, on the show as executive producer will bring, will bring in a, more money, presumably. It'll bring in more money for him. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, there's well, the, there's, the, there's the a line. There's the a line that I've heard. Okay. I, I don't think they're. I mean, I would assume that they've already got their backing and all that stuff that they've announced it. I, I, it, I will say it's it's nice to be. I mean, there. You know, it's nice that there's uh you know with American Gods and and this one. It's nice that people like Netflix. I don't, I don't know who's doing it if it's Netflix or Hulu or or Stars or whoever it is, but there's so many. Um, I think it's HBO. There's HBO. There's so many. Uh, uh, literary works being transferred to the screen now. It's exciting. Uh, it's an exciting new time for that. And and I, and the other thing is, I haven't read the book either, but I, have, I haven't read it. Is a lot of times they take the world. American Gods is very much a literal translate. You know, uh, translation of the book. It, it's pretty beat for beat. A lot of times, what they'll do is they'll take the world as a concept. Um, and they'll kind of make it a sandbox where they kind of play with different themes and ideas. So it may not be a very literal translation of the book, especially if it's a series, or it might, or it might be. But um, if, it could just be that they've, it could be something as simple as a studio development exec was intrigued by the idea, and boy, we could do so much with this concept. Bought the book, bought the concept, um, and uh, and you know, probably bringing the. I would assume they're bringing Ruff in as a as a producer and a writer of some sort as well, but. Um, and put somebody like Jordan Peele in charge, who right has a lot of cred right now, a lot of cachet because of Get Out success. So um, it's, it's a really good fit. I find this sort of, in some ways, fascinating, and I, I don't want to misspeak again. But okay, I wait a minute. I didn't think I wanted to say before you go on that as a person who has not yet read Lovecraft Country, I thought that was a really sound analysis that you gave a few minutes ago. Yeah, so yeah, well, you didn't you didn't yeah. misspeak. Here's the thing. It's it's um. Lovecraft has gotten an enormous amount of adulation with a uh, Library of America book, um, recognition of uh, by mainstream people like Del Toro and King as to the importance of his work, and yet actually bringing a Lovecraftian work to the general public has been difficult. You have small labors of love, even something expensive and beautiful as The Whisperer in Darkness, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. I mean, how many people have really seen it? Uh, okay, so instead what you have is this book that's written as a response to the racism uh, in pulp fiction and uh, in the current day with Lovecraft on the, as the face of that racism and we're going to write, in other words, you have to write your response to this particular content. Do you see what I mean? And that, bam, gets all kinds of backing and funding right away. I just find yeah. it kind of, it's, it's, it's just, uh, I don't want to open up too big a can well, of Well, I can tell you, I've had direct experience pitching Lovecraft-themed um, projects to studio executives. And I can tell you, I've, the two times that I've done it, and I never did it again, I've got the exact same response, which was, oh, God, not Lovecraft, please. And I was and like, what, okay, what moving that? on. Moving on to the next pitch Yeah, idea. what specifically did they yeah, say? What I was think the, the general feeling is oh, it's oversaturated. It's ah. everywhere. It's, I mean, it's a Monopoly game. It's every, I think it's kind of that, I mean, I think it's, I mean, that's my assumption is they just feel like, and it's so broad and it's so vague and it's been duplicated and, you know, and replicated and redone and redone and redone so much. And at least in the literary side of things, um, not so much to Matt's point on the television or film side of things, other than the low budget, um, you know, lower budget kind of horror movies of, of the And 90s. mostly sort of, I mean, bordering on parody, I've found. I mean, over the right. years, I I was sort of turned, one of the reasons I was turned off to Lovecraft for such a long time was that the film adaptations and TV uh, films that I saw 
were so silly. You know, right. I mean, there haven't been a lot of serious adaptations. There have been no. some, but not not a lot. And that's what I was. I mean, I was pitching. What I was pitching was uh, a show that was sort of set in Lovecraft. To more to Kelly's point, set in Lovecraft geographical location where strange things occurred and there were different characters that wove in and out, sort of like they did with Once Upon a Time, but but more like a Lovecraft thing. And yeah, the, the I think there's just a general repulsion, at least in the entertainment industry, at least in the film and TV entertainment industry, uh, for things that are straight Lovecraft. I mean, I'm, I mean Guillermo del Toro, del Toro was trying to make Mounds of Madness, been trying to make it for 10 years, and even that guy can't get that movie fun. Yeah, That's Lovecraft, he can't Art get it made, movies. then who can? Yeah, whereas you take somebody who's got a Stephen King book, man, there it's like a it's like a feeding frenzy. So it's an interesting. But, but, but why are they Why are they so opposed when when you have the saturation level? You would think. I mean, we we look at the output and of the entertainment industry, and it seems like they are mightily attracted to built in fan base. Um, that there's something to that will put butts in the seats to begin with. Um, I'd almost think they'd look, it's like, okay, hey, vampires were real big for a while, then it was zombies for a while, and, and now it's starting to look like this Lovecraft thing is becoming the new zombies vampire thing. I would think that would be a an attraction because if it's got a fan base, they would start to see dollar signs. Well, all they I, need to do is, is push it and expand it more to, to, to a mainstream viewing audience. Well, what, what, what studio execs are always looking for is they want a trope that is well known and that they can easily package and market, but they want it original, an original perspective on that trope. You know, they want to turn it on its head so that what they're doing is is considered fresh, um, and that I think is probably what's happening with this Lovecraft Country series that's been announced. Is they've taken the Lovecraft concept, which they'll I'm sure they'll use in their marketing, um, but they're bringing an original kind of an original perspective or, or fresh perspective to it, which is which is you know great. And that's probably what they've been looking for because I think the traditional storytelling, the traditional mythos, I think is not interesting to them just as but well, first, I really don't know why. I'm not, I, I, can, but it is, it is, it is that can we way. back up a second for, for, for those who have read it, though? Because one of the – I've seen several people online mention that, geez, there's not much mythos in this book. Is that not true or is that true? Uh, well, it's not a mythos story. It is a Lovecraftian story. Yeah, I mean, is it cosmic it's about, horror? I, sh I should have said, I guess. Sort of. There's – it's like I read this a couple of years ago, and I'm, I'm, but it basically there's this um, secret organization. There's this very powerful family, and they have spells that they use to maintain this power, and they use them to contact across dimensions. Okay, but you have to be of the correct bloodline. Now it turns out uh, with the right hanky panky that bloodline might not be in the right person that you want to put the face on it. Do, do, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then it's a question of battling for access to this power to the, for these tomes. That, in that sense, that's Lovecraftian. But no, it's not Cthulhu mythos at all. It doesn't sound like cosmic horror really either. It, but but, but it, haven't it, we it have some Lovecraftian come, tropes in it? Haven't we come a far way where when we say Lovecraft Country, and I'm not talking about the book specifically, but in general, um, Lovecraft Country can mean more than one thing. It could be a Cthulhu mythos thing. It could be a cosmic horror thing. It could be set in Lovecraft's New England. I mean, and it does, or, or, or it could be any a number of things intertwined. Um, I, I just think because of the amount of work we've seen over the years by the multitude of writers we've seen that 
Lovecraft Country as, as an umbrella um, could be any one of a whole bunch of different things. Sure, it could be any one of a whole bunch of things, but the question really is, in my mind, is it cosmic horror or is it Cthulhu mythos? And it sounds like the answer is no to both. But but it it that's not uh, completely encompassing of Lovecraftian. I mean the yeah I know, I mean, it, but it, it's what most people think of. Well, this gets to where most, I thought like this I said, what most the, Lovecraft readers think of. I should say the, the weird. Well, that's what I'm talking about, though. Like, it, that, it, that's not at one point it was A or B, and it was almost pretty sharp line, but. In the last, especially let's say the last decade, we've seen so much Lovecraftian fiction. I, the the lines have blurred. We've we've come away from it's A or it's B, and it can now be G and I and M and Y. Well, I have no opinion because I've not read the book, but I'm just I'm curious about it. So. I will say that the Amazon description says it's a wondrous work of the imagination that melds historical fiction, pulp noir, and Lovecraftian horror and fantasy. So take that as you may. I have the book. It's sitting in my dresser. Sounds room. about like what Matt described. Yeah. I'll read it and uh, may I'll give an update to the report. And my feeling on this is that um, any focus on Lovecraft is good focus. If you're a horror fan and you want more Lovecraft in your life, having somebody like Jordan Peele back something that says Lovecraft in the title is going to mean that other things are going to be made that you like. Uh, there's, uh, there's no doubt that he has changed the game with Get Out. We're going to see a lot of racially charged thrillers now. Some of them are going to be good. Some of them are going to be really bad. They're going to verge on exploitation again, just like they did back in the 70s but if this is the kind of stuff you're interested in then what you want is an influx of that kind of stuff right i mean sure, that's what i want I think i'm actually going to say you've got to judge this on its own merits when it's i mean there's enough compelling stuff in the book that even if they just do a straight up adaptation with the right script and the right actors this could be really good stuff you yeah, know, I and I I'll let you know what I think too when I finish reading the book, Mike. But um, but I am very excited to see what Peel does next. Um, Get Out was brilliant, and I'm ready for whatever he's whatever he's willing to take on, whatever project interests him. I will be interested in seeing. Well, it's interesting because when I published Autumn Cthulhu, I got comments uh, from reviews and other places, and everywhere from. Wow, that's the new face of Lovecraftian, and, and you know, to some people, not that it was anything, but you know, that was some comments. To all the way to, wow, this book sucks. It wasn't Lovecraftian at all, you know. So in some sense, it's in the eye of the beholder. And the more popular something is, the more reviews you get, the more readers you have, the more it will be divided. This is what I'm finding about books in general. If you look at the the best selling uh, most you know, exciting books that are out there right now that everybody wants to read. People are sharply divided in their opinions, and and um, it depends depends on the expectations that readers bring to it. Um, you know, some people just simply do not read the description for a book or a film. They come to it and they bring their own expectations, and if you don't meet those expectations, then they're mad, they're disappointed, and that's that's just the way it is. That's just how it is. You know. And other people will take the time to read a sample from a book, say, oh, this is right for me, and then, you know, and then they'll read it and they'll be satisfied. But the more people see your film or read your book, the more you're going to get this split. Yeah. But interestingly, yeah. though, the split sometimes, as you said, mad and disappointed, some of them are disappointed. Some of them get really mad. <laughs> That's the reaction I've never been able to understand. Like, come on, it's 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 a book, it's a movie, you know. That's true. Yeah. That's true, and I don't understand it. I don't always understand it either. But I will say, it's kind of cool that people get that passionate about books and films. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that says that you have reached a larger audience. There's, uh, there's going to be the people who are just going to glom onto something, or at least it used to be this way back in the late 80s when 
if you were a Lovecraft fan, you would just latch on to anything that came out that was Lovecraftian because that was all you got. Now we've got a lot of stuff, and it may be that people are getting burnt out on hearing Cthulhu or Lovecraft or whatever, but that's only because it's reaching a much larger od audience, I think. Yeah. Well, and I do think that even this show uh, will bring a lot of awareness to probably a new generation of, you know, viewers, uh, younger folks who may not be familiar with Lovecraft who will, watch, will tune into something like this because Peel's involved, who will probably not want to start, unless they completely <laughs> annihilate him, his character on the show. I don't know. But I can see it opening some, you know, some new readers to Lovecraft's fiction and so it could be a good thing, ultimately. Sure. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Kelly. And a lot of people who aren't as intimate with this stuff as, as we are might only have a thumbnail idea of what this material is. You know, they've heard something or, you know, um, but they haven't experienced it. They haven't delved into it. So when they're actually confronted by that book, or that film, perhaps for whatever reason, it doesn't fit into their expectation of what they thought it was going to be. Um, and, and just just the nature of everything in general. I mean, look at social media. The, the lines get more and more severe as, as things become larger and larger. I'd, I'd like to point out that I agree with Joe when he agrees with me. Yeah, I'd like to yeah point out that Joe said that Kelly was right. Or maybe maybe I just agree with me. That should probably be what I say from now on. <laughs> well, after after how many uh, vodka lemonades, you should be agreeing with. And how many shows? Don't judge me. It's a uh, it's a very hot day here, and uh, it's too hot for scotch. So vodka lemonade is on the menu. Well, we're glad, even though it's a hot day, you decided like to attend with clothes on. One of these days, someone's going to tell Kelly about ice water, and this whole world's going to change. So. Yeah, what's I, the fun in that? I said I wanted something to drink, not something to wash with. My yeah, it hydrates you, big deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we were going to talk about. Doctor Who and about our Kelly suggested a while back our three favorite Stephen King stories and I'm going to leave both of those topics till next time since we covered all the rest of this for most of the show and because hopefully it didn't come through but I'm not feeling all that well no. uh, but it was great to have Mike Kelly on the show and this has been a really illuminating conversation about Lovecraft Country so yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess, Kelly, I think there's two schools of thought on this, and I don't particularly subscribe to, subscribe to one or the other. I just think I can see them both. Uh, you said that any, you know, I anything is good, essentially, right? That's, um, that's kind of how I feel about it, yeah. Yeah, well, the other part of it is at what SP, uh, the other side of it would be SP saying she wasn't interested in Lovecraft because of the treatment it had got in the theater you know, <clears throat> these silly movies so it can have the opposite effect mm -hmm. so who knows mm -hmm. well yeah I, I agree with me though oh uh, yeah well <laughs> and i agree with you when you agreed with you so if, if, if this tv show lasts there'll probably be pressure to make it more overtly lovecraft it's growing overt mythos references and things but well, once, once, it's up, it, once, once it's up and running and, and there's an just from if there's any trailers uh, or when the first episode pilot hits just think of I mean social media will erupt maybe, maybe it'll lean to this is great maybe it'll lean to no it's not but maybe it'll be severely you know uh, juxtaposed this is a piece of shit. Most likely. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. And, 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 and think about how that can descend. You know, I mean, oh. oh, gosh. You know, wasn't there just recently a post on Necronomicon where the right wing trolls got out of control? Yeah. 
you know, I just, I'm just grateful that they have such a, a, a nice uh, zero tolerance policy there, I got to tell you. What are you talking about? Uh, there was a recent, um, who was the guy? Uh, someone. Necronomicon had, Providence Post and some, some people started to get to drag things down into the mud. Right. Oh. All right. A typical, you know, just the typical that goes on these days on occasion. Somebody's, you know, had nothing to say for two months and so they decide they need a little attention or something. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe they hadn't had their diaper changed soon enough that day. <laughs> Did I say that? Rick, well, were you I must, I must, It must be this vodka lemonade oh. Kelly put in my teacup. There you go. Cheers. Well, Neil, Neil keeps it really good at the con, so I don't want any listeners, viewers, to think that they yeah. have to put up with that ugly sort of stuff. Yeah, um, no, he does a great job with that and with everything. Yes, he does. It's really, it's really just a fun time. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, thanks, guys. Let's give away prizes. If you want, let's see, we're giving away uh, Mists of the Miskatonic uh, by Al Halsey. Did I say that right? Um, and that's a collection of short stories. And then <laughs> Philip has four audio books uh, of Behold the Void. So five prizes in all. So Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com is the email to send a message to. Uh, in the subject, uh, write your prize that you want, either Behold the Void or Mists of the Miskatonic. And Lovecraft Easing Prizes at gmail.com. And about a week from now, I'll use random.org to choose the, the winners. So thanks, guys. Great discussion today. Hey, Mike, I have can one I make question? one? Yeah. Oh. yeah. As, as a sometimes wingman for... For Kelly Young, our special mm -hmm. prosecutor this week, um, is oh, Miss of the Miskatonic. Is is that blended or is it a single mall? <laughs> that looks like a single mall to me. Yeah, there you go. Uh, SP, you had something. I just wanted to make a brief announcement. My um, the publisher Dunham's Manor Press is um, publishing a paperback edition of my novella called Muscadines, and it's only seven dollars. So if you look up Dunham's Manor Press online, uh, my Shirley Jackson Award nominated novella is now available in paperback in a very inexpensive edition. Yeah, with, the, with, so with the illustrations, as people you know, we've seen not it. with the interior illustrations, with the cover art by Dave Felton, and um, Jordan has added uh, some more of Dave Felton's art. He created a poster, and uh, we used it for publish for uh, publicity purposes, but he didn't get to use it in the book, so mm. he's put that poster on the back of the paperback edition. So you only get that poster uh, image if you buy the paperback edition. Oh, it's a great story. Okay. It really Thank is. You. Thank you. Dave Felton's work is is quite beautiful too. Yeah, so it is good. still available in the hardcover edition with Dave's illustrations if people want that. So Dunham's again, Manor go Press. to Dunham's Manor Press. Google yes. that. And you'll get to yes. their website. I have the hardcover. Thanks, Mike. Book. So well now you have to get the soft cover too if I, you want that if you want that art. This piece killing me. <laughs> 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 I can arrange for you to have a paperback. You're killing him, SP. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I was very impressed, finally, with uh, the newest Doctor Who episode, so I do want to talk about that next week. because It's a part of a trilogy, I believe. Right, Rick? So, uh, my understanding. First of a three-parter would be more accurate. Yeah, it's a continued story. Yeah. So, anyway... Thanks, everybody, for watching and listening, and we will see you next week.